Hey guys, it's Jane. I'm here to do another taster today. I haven't done one of these in a while. It's basically a short excerpt from a book. And today I'm going to do a reading from Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. I talked about this a little bit in my Mystery Monday video uploaded yesterday. And I just thought um, it because his style of writing is... Uh, one of the big attractions of his books. I thought it might be a good idea just to give a bit of a taste so you can have the flavour of what a Raymond Chandler story sounds like. So I'm just going to give you a few pages from towards the beginning. It's not right at the beginning, but towards the beginning of the story. And in this excerpt, we meet uh, Philip Marlowe. We also meet General Sternwood, who is Philip Marlowe's client in this story. Uh, and um, we hear a little bit about General Sternwood's daughters, who are also quite important characters in the story. So here goes. We went out at the French doors and along a smooth red flagged path that skirted the far side of the lawn from the garage. The boyish looking chauffeur had a big black and chromium sedan out and was dusting that. The path took us along to the side of the greenhouse and the butler opened a door for me and stood aside. It opened into a sort of vestibule that was about as warm as a slow oven. He came in after me, shut the outer door, opened the inner door and we went through that. Then it was really hot. The air was thick, wet, steamy and larded, with the cloying smell of tropical orchids in bloom. The glass walls and roof were heavily misted and big drops of moisture splashed down on the plants. The light had an unreal greenish colour like light filtered through an aquarium tank. The plants filled the place, a forest of them, with nasty meaty leaves and stalks like the newly washed fingers of dead men. They smelled as overpowering as boiled alcohol under a blanket. The butler did his best to get me through without being smacked in the face by the sodden leaves and after a while we came to a clearing in the middle of the jungle under the domed roof. Here in a space of hexagonal flags an old red Turkish rug was laid down and on the rug was a wheelchair and in the wheelchair an old and obviously dying man watched us come with black eyes from which all fire had died long ago, but which still had the coal black directness of the eyes in the portrait that hung above the mantel in the hall. The rest of his face was a leaden mask with the bloodless lips and the sharp nose and the sunken temples and the outward turned earlobes of approaching dissolution. His long, narrow body was wrapped in that heat in a travelling rug and a faded red bathrobe. His thin, claw-like hands were folded loosely on the rug, purple-nailed. A few locks of dry white hair clung to his scalp like wildflowers fighting for life on a bare rock. The butler stood in front of him and said, This is Mr Marlowe, General. The old man didn't move or speak or even nod, he just looked at me lifelessly. The butler pushed a damp wicker chair against the backs of my legs and I sat down and he took my hat with a deft scoop. The old man dragged his voice up from the bottom of a well and said, Brandy, Norris. How do you like your brandy, sir? Any way at all, I said. The butler went away among the abominable plants and the general spoke again, slowly, using his strength as carefully as an out-of-work showgirl uses her last good pair of stockings. I used to like mine with champagne. The champagne as cold as Valley Forge and about a third of a glass of brandy beneath it. You may take your coat off, sir. It's too hot in here for a man with blood in his veins. I stood up and peeled off my coat and got a handkerchief out and mopped my face and neck and the backs of my wrists. 
St Louis in August had nothing on that place. I sat down and felt automatically for a cigarette and then I stopped. The old man caught the gesture and smiled faintly. You may smoke, sir. I like the smell of tobacco. I lit the cigarette and blew a lungful at him and he sniffed at it like a terrier at a rat hole. The faint smile pulled at the shadowed corners of his mouth. A nice state of affairs when a man has to indulge his vices by proxy, he said dryly. You are looking at a very dull survival of a rather gaudy life. A cripple, paralysed in both legs and with only half of his lower belly. There's very little that I can eat and my sleep is so close to waking that it is hardly worth the name. I seem to exist largely on heat, like a newborn spider, and the orchids are an excuse for the heat. Do you like orchids? Not particularly, I said. The general half closed his eyes. They are nasty things. Their flesh is too much like the flesh of men and their perfume has the rotten sweetness of a prostitute. I stared at him with my mouth open. The soft, wet heat was like a pall around us. The old man nodded as if his neck was afraid of the weight of his head and then the butler came pushing back through the jungle with a tea wagon mixed me a brandy and soda, swathed the copper ice bucket with a damp napkin and went softly away among the orchids. A door opened and shut behind the jungle. I sipped the drink. The old man licked his lips watching me over and over again, drawing one lip slowly across the other with a funereal absorption like an undertaker dry washing his hands. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlowe. I suppose I have the right to ask. Sure, but there's very little to tell. I'm 33 years old, went to college once and can still speak English if there's any demand for it. There isn't much in my trade. I worked for Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, as an investigator once. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Oles, called me and told me you wanted to see me. I'm unmarried because I don't like policemen's wives. And a little bit of a cynic, the old man smiled. You didn't like working for Wilde? I was fired for insubordination. I test very high on insubordination, General. I always did myself, sir. I'm glad to hear it. And what do you know about my family? I'm told you're a widower and have two young daughters both pretty and both wild. One of them has been married three times, the last time to an ex-bootlegger who went in the trade by the name of Rusty Regan. That's all I heard, General. Did any of it strike you as peculiar? The Rusty Regan part, maybe. But I always got along with bootleggers myself. He smiled a very faint, economical smile. It seems I do too. I'm very fond of Rusty. A big curly-headed Irishman from Clonmel with sad eyes and a smile as wide as Wilshire Boulevard. The first time I saw him I thought he might be what you're probably thinking he was, an adventurer who happened to get himself wrapped up in some velvet. You must have liked him, I said. You learned to talk the language. He put his thin, bloodless hands under the edge of the rug. I put my cigarette stub out and finished my drink. He was the breath of life to me while he lasted. He spent hours with me, sweating like a pig, drinking brandy by the quart and telling me stories of the Irish Revolution. He'd been an officer in the IRA. He wasn't even legally in the United States. It was a ridiculous marriage, of course, and it probably didn't last a month as a marriage. I'm telling you the family secrets, Mr. Marlowe. They're still secrets, I said. What happened to him? The old man looked at me woodenly. He went away a month ago, abruptly, 
without a word to anyone, without saying goodbye to me. That hurt a little, but he'd been raised in a rough school. I'll hear from him one of these days. Meantime, I'm being blackmailed again. I said, again? He brought his hands from under the rug with a brown envelope in them. I should have been very sorry for anybody who tried to blackmail me while Rusty was around. A few months before he came, that is to say uh, nine or ten months ago, I paid a man named Joe Brody $5,000 to let my younger daughter Carmen alone. Ah, uh, I said. He moved his thin white eyebrows. That means what? Nothing, I said. He went on staring at me, half frowning, and then he said, take this envelope and examine it and help yourself to the brandy. I think we'll leave it there for today. So that was a taste of The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler. I hope you're all well and I'll talk to you later. Bye.